All right. Um, the user space control of memory management. Uh, that's what I'll be talking about today. It's a fairly, it's not a heavy or detailed uh, presentation. It's mostly about soliciting input about an, uh, uh, a subject that, like was remarked in an earlier session, is probably going to be of some importance in the coming years with you know page placement in the in the face of memory tiering um so let's get started so the involvement of user space for kernel and kernel in kernel decisions of course has that very old question where is the line of control exactly between kernel and user space it's gone back and forth a lot um over the years i won't mention the word microkernel here but yes it has <laughs> gone back a lot over the uh for a lot over the decades um recently we've seen a bit of a move back to user space in some areas like like networking because you know at least handing things off to probes because of the flexibility of bpf um there's also been a demand for some orchestrator-like interfaces to be able to manipulate other processes like process M advice. And there was a recent proposal for PDFD set mem policy. So where exactly does that line lie? Uh, and you know what line exactly is useful? Um, so what I'm gonna do here is just outline some prototyping that I have done that based on our discussions um, at Google, where we do have some experience with trying to push things out to user space a bit more and then get opinions and input, you know, saying, okay, well, if I were to finish this and send it upstream and as an RFC, how would you react? Would you like it? Would you say I'm totally barking up the wrong tree? Um, so that's kind of interesting uh, to me and to my co-developers. Uh, I should also say I'm not really replace, uh, looking to replace ex existing mechanisms at this point. The idea more is here you know, to restructure the code so that user space actors who think they can do better than the kernel can attempt to do so. So the idea is to give user space enough rope and see what it does with it. Um, so quick list of existing uh, mechanisms that you're all familiar with not complete uh, but you know basically from less involved to more involved we all know the vm vm parameters that controls various vm thresholds swappiness uh, what have you uh, on a slightly smaller level there's the c group limits and related to that there is proactive reclaim then we have M advice, which has grown quite a long list of options, which in itself may be an argument that maybe there should be something more generic that you can control from user space. Uh, M advice uh, falls in basically into two categories. It's like setting a hint inside the kernel or doing a one-shot action, such as you know, don't need and and some of its friends. Uh, then there's mem policy and mbind de dealing with NUMA nodes, and without a doubt, the most involved one that actually diverts the code path to user space is a user fault FD, um, which I won't be talking about. Although I did see a comment on the mailing list that user fault FD is definitely important when you're talking about user space control, and I agree, it is just not what what i've been looking at at this context although if you're looking at you know and, and want to discuss an interesting um development that came out of user fault fd usage i i would encourage you to uh, attend uh, james's uh, hdm huge tlbfs talk um, that will follow shortly i'm going to mainly be focusing on sort of the m advice and mem policy space here so the motivation here is, of course, how to squeeze the most performance out of applications in the face of an environment where 
um, you have an increasingly complex system architecture. So the third point there, memory tiering. Uh, what we have um, at Google is we often have containerized workloads. They have divergent patterns. There's multi-tenancy and there's memory tiering. So far memory uh, swap maybe, and then also Z swap. Um, we have some previous success with pushing things out to user space in, in, in farm memory, uh, where we actually had a farm memory daemon that based on detailed information from the kernel um, would make decisions on, on memory migration. Uh, that has been documented in some of the other papers that we, we've written over the years. Um, so the, what I'm going to do here is sort of describe a general idea that I had that I think may be useful when exploring this space and that I've been prototyping and then hoping to get some feedback on that to see if people think that this is a good direction to move in. Um, let me see. So the idea here is that you provide some to find some general hint and control structure inside the kernel. Uh, it needs to be easily accessible in all contexts. I will go into those contexts in a later slide. Um, you pass that control information to BPF probes attached to trace points, that strategic points in the kernel when you want to make a memory management you know, page play placement, usually, but not always, kind of decision. Um, and then you can, in user space can steer the probes via BPF map manipulation. So uh, the BPF maps will actually be mostly read only from, as far as the probes are concerned, user space actually manipulates them, the probes read them, and then also to see what user space wants, it looks at the control information it gets from the kernel, comes to a decision. Um, and via a bit of writable memory that is passed to it and passes its verdict to the kernel, which then takes the ball and rolls with it. Um, so what is there currently in this space? Well, we've got M advice um, that well, sometimes it does a one shot operation, but other times it, it, it uh, sets a VMA flag We've got mem policy that has the mem policy struct. Uh, it's accessible via VMA or via a special lookup for um, shared memory where things are a little bit more difficult, a little bit more complicated. Um, again, I'm not necessarily looking to replace these. I'm just seeing what would happen if I implemented sort of a new structure that tried to combine these in a way that BPF probes could act on them. Um, so structure won't be allocated and attached if new framework is not used. So not looking to use more memory or extend existing structures much. Anyway, not much anyway at this point. Um, the information within the control structure, it could even be opaque to the kernel. I mean, it's not always clear where that boundary should be. If it's only for consumption of the BPF probe, then the, the kernel doesn't even necessarily need to understand what's in it, as long as the BPF probe does know. Um, so that would lead to like a very simple interface to set things up, like you know, tag a VMA with this opaque value. Um, that does lead to sort of namespacing issues. Um, for example, one of our earlier ideas was, well, we've got the Anon name um, for anonymous memory VMAs now. So why don't we try encoding um, hinting information into that? And then we quickly real realized that, you know, several other teams within Google were already starting to use this Anon name structure so that we'd be stepping on whatever they had put in there. So that means that we would have to define a company-wide namespace for the string that is stored in there. 
And that would also mean that any BPF probe trying to use the hint information would have to do string parsing to get the right hinting information out of it. And it just, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's not great. So that's the kind of thing that you, you, uh, you get there. So you are looking at an interface that you can say, okay, well, I'm only going to use it for this particular purpose. Um, so context. So some contexts in the kernel are natural fit for, you know, accessing some sort of control structure. Um, for example, if you're in a context where the VMA is available, uh, you already have one, the a probe call usually is fine within those contexts and you've got the VMA, just take a pointer out of it to say your control structure and you have all the information you want. Uh, other contexts are more pro problematic. Um, in the reclaim path, you just have a page or folio list and then you don't know exactly what this page belongs to. Well, you can figure it out, but it just gets more complicated. Um, so there are a couple options. You sort of, sort of do an RMAP like lookup or maybe worse, a page extension. Um, there's another problem in that context. If you're walking through page lists and you call a BPF probe for each page, that's not optimal. Um, I mean, especially not if you are in context like, you know, direct reclaim where tail latency is, is, is a problem. And you're going to add all these calls to BPF probes. I mean, it's, it's not great in general, especially in those kind of contexts that would just not be good. So there is, there are some, some performance issues to consider there. Um, so given that idea, what have, have we done so far? So. I did some prototyping made mainly to see, okay, are there like a couple of interesting things that I can do with some basic infrastructure and can I do um, what MEM policy and M advice are already doing? Of course, if you can't even, you know, do what the existing infrastructure is already doing, then you might as well um, give up right now. Um, so here's a couple of things that I implemented. Um, I modified the MTLRU access bit scanner that, that creates newer, younger generations, uh, sort of as a proof of concept. Basically, it makes um, accesses by certain processes count more than other processes. So they, so essentially, they sort of have a nice value, so to speak, you know, compared to the schedule, a nice value that keeps their pages um, um, artificially younger and less likely to be pushed down uh, and eventually end up in swap. Uh, the practical value of that is questionable, but you know it's a nice proof of concept. Uh, it's straightforward to implement since it's a separate scanner. Overhead is not that much of a concern. Uh, the scan is done by walking MMs and then VMAs. So the context is fine. You've got everything available that you need. So that was an easy one. Um, the second one is a compressibility hints. Um, as you may know at Google, we use Zswap as, as end storage or not, not just front storage as actual end storage for, for pages uh, that we like to save. So you store them compressed and you save some memory, you get rid of the original uncompressed page. Um, so compressibility hints can actually be useful because you may end up wasting some time trying to compress pages that are just not good enough uh, because there's a certain ratio that you need for this to be all useful. Um, so sometimes you end up examining a bunch of pages that don't actually compress well and you end up giving up. Um, now, if the um, application had provided hints on those pages saying, for example, what some applications do is they actually have cold pages that they compress themselves. So then they could provide a compressibility hint saying, hey, don't even bother with these guys. Uh, you want to use Z swap 
try something else. Um, so that's functionally not that hard to implement. Um, I have not m measured the overhead yet with uh, the BPF Pro Active. I haven't done that for any of these, so I still need to do that. Uh, the initial NUMA allocation are also not that hard to do. We had to shuffle around the main policy code just a little bit so that I could trickle up the node through the right code path always from the BPF Pro. But yeah, and I'll, th 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 that also works basically. I said, you know, for certain processes in a BPF map, I, said, I, I sort of faked it and say, you are only going to allocate from this particular node. And then at the same time, also set the memory policy for them and it worked to be if probe just overrode that decision every time. And uh, then lastly, very, very simple case, M advice, huge page of no or no huge page. So essentially that was just changing the, the flag checks into BPF Pro call. That's probably the most boring one. Um, so I think this is a, a sort of an interesting direction to take, even if there are performance concerns at the very least, I think that's sort of an interesting vehicle to at least test the how feasible it is to do some some things in user space or you know maybe sort of test certain placement policies or what have you out uh, or, or what have you in user space by sort of putting maybe a library on top of this that manipulates the maps um so my question is to you what do you think does this make sense um have you done something similar like this um so yeah, tell me. I can't hear anything to mom at the moment, so either there are no questions or I have been cut off from audio. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I have kind of a general question. Why is BPF chosen for this? Is it just for prototyping to prove those ideas or this is like a final solution that you are looking for? It's not necessarily the final solution. It is just that it's the most flexible one. Um, essentially, uh, so it, it combines flexibility with still a certain amount of performance since I mean, you know, probes do get run directly in the kernel and there's no transition to user space there. Uh, I'm not wedded to that that particular solution, but it it, it seemed like a, a good a good starting point. Right. So let me rephrase it. Um, are you looking for flexibility in the final solution or is this flexibility that you have with BPF is needed for prototyping only? So in other words, do you look at those controls as something you would want the user space to have flexibility to modify the logic? Like two different customers might modify it different ways or are you looking at controls which are generic enough that everybody can use the same way? Um, the way I see it now, I think um having a bpf solution available that makes use of this framework is 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 a good thing um i'm not sure if, if there maybe should be other ways to use it but having bpf hooks i think is a good thing yes yeah i guess one uh, pushback you can hit into is uh the uh of, of course, that uh, is establishing a certain uh, APIs guarantees that uh, are kind of tricky to be maintained forever, uh, especially when they are uh, predefined. I, I, I can understand that um, uh, if you do not have a cast in stone kind of entry points for a BPF, that would be easier to sell. But as long as you would be trying to add... Um, fixed trace points that might be 
a roadblock that would be kind of hard to step over without showing that there is absolutely no other way around your problem to be solved by existing means. Hmm. Yeah, that that's interesting. I mean, I would imagine you're running into sort of fixed ABI issues one way or the other. I mean, if you're using BPF, I mean, you could use the K funks, but then you're exposed to, you know, the, the changing kernel interfaces. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, do, do you think that there would, there would be a, a better way to get sort of a stable interface? Yeah, I mean, if you uh, well define the user interface, uh, then the bar is obviously quite high already, but uh, um, you establish a certain well defined operation rather than just an entry point and do whatever you like with that. And I guess right. uh, that then the difference might not be all that great or all that big, but but um, um, I'm a little bit afraid that uh, well or making a well defined entry points at a, and into low level um, memory management uh, functionality would be much harder than starting from the entry point from the user space, which is kind of more use case defined rather than here we do aging, do whatever, whatever you like with that. Sure, sure. I, I, I see what you mean. So you're saying, okay, well, you know, keep the, 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 the control structure and the, the new infrastructure that you're, you're adding in the kernel but just have kernel code act directly on the information that you attach and don't don't leave it to BPF probe. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, essentially, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I understand. I mean, this is definitely has, was a, a, a point of discussion that, that we had to, um, we, for now, we've settled on the, 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 the BPF method and but you're right. I mean, yeah, it's 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 a good argument. So we'll we'll, we'll see where we land there. Yeah, I, I think you'd have had more interest in this idea if it had happened before Process M Advise landed. Um, you know, they they seem to occupy much the same space in terms of I can control what that process does rather than it controlling its own destiny. Um, I mean, I'm I'm still kind of curious where this goes. It it it, it doesn't necessarily feel entirely dead on arrival to me, but it, I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes. Uh, I, I don't know if I'd necessarily give up on it just yet, but it, it needs to demonstrate something for me to get excited about it. That, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the next steps here is for us to develop this further and to actually show um, applications that, that can use this framework and get tangible results that that will make people more okay i mean if if we cannot get those tangible results then you know obviously we are not <laughs> no longer interested in it so but yeah i see what you mean i mean and as for process m advice uh yes uh that is essentially Similar in, in a way that it means, you know, one process controlling memory mass decisions for of uh, made in another process at our space. But this would allow just basically a wide variety of policies in a wide variety of, 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 of contexts. But I mean, I, I absolutely take your point. I mean, you, you, you got to, you know, show a use case and, and, and some results. Otherwise, you know, you're not going anywhere. Um, Frank, I might have missed this, but is there somewhere in your prototype where you populate these structures with the characteristics of the different either NUMA nodes or memory regions with regards to, you talked about near and far memory earlier. Is there mm -hmm. a concept that user space can look at this structure and go, okay, this, this region is near, this region is far, this region is whatever, when it's making these placement decisions? Uh Currently, it just uses um, if 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 you want to set the, the 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 structure up. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 
So for the prototypes, uh, it was essentially very, um, very simple. Um, I simply used um, a assumed a static node system. I populated the structure by default with 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 the, the, the memory tiering um, information, and then use space provided the, um, the the preferences it had for 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 for, for the nodes. Um, so the, the kernel uh, put in the, the defaults and and then the, the BPF maps as read by the BPF has provided the overrides, so so to speak. Um, and so that is the step. So you usually something you know will be initialized by by, by default, although currently in a prototype if if you don't even have a BPF probe attached to it, the, the structure is not even there. It doesn't get used at all. So, so then you don't even need to do any any any, any association. But yes, that there, there are some defaults that are set there, but there isn't really anything anything special going on. So, you know, I, I mean, just to, 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 I, I see we're almost at the end anyway. Um, so I just say, okay, yeah, I mean, what I'm certainly interested in is if what others, other views are, you know, in, in a memory tiering world, um, remarks are made, I was like, okay, well, it's impossible for the kernel to get this completely right. And I mean, user space has to offer something more so I'm, I, I look forward to a discussion about you know the ideas that that, that 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 other people had in this in this space certainly um and i'm hoping that you know we're going to explore this path for a little while longer and then hoping that we can come uh, you'll see me come back to the mailing list in a, in a couple of months saying here's what i did and these were the exciting exciting results that i got what do you think now so Yeah, I, I would just add that um, doing those little experiments uh, with what you have uh, might be really an interesting input in the problem definition. So you can see, okay, I, I can achieve doing this. Let's discuss how to do that properly with respect to future maintenance of that uh, of that feature. And uh, so I, I really like the, the the BPF kind of approach of probing the problem. I'm just not really seeing that this would be the final destination for that particular feature. But I mean, maybe there are policies that are so hard to define in general case that uh, in the end, we might just land on the A set of, let's say, high level and well described uh, entry points where you can change the behavior. We have discussed that couple of years back with respect to OM killer decision, where it's really hard to define what's your best strategy in the end. Uh, we just gave up on that. But um, that might be one example of, um, of something that can be outsourced because um, you just have to make some decision. It really doesn't matter what kind of decision you make you just tell us what to do and we just do the thing that it's really hard to do from the user space because you are in such a, a constrained conditions that it's really hard to read some statistics or, or something. So yeah, I, I would just conclude from my point of view that uh, um, that playing with BPF is really interesting, um, but uh, final solution would really need a careful thought to not export too much and tie ourselves into hard to develop situation. Sure. I, I, I take your point. Thanks. Okay. It seems that there are no other questions in the room. So unless you have anything last few words or then thank you. No, thank you.